Okay, we're live. Hello and welcome along to episode 11 of the Lifting in Life podcast. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Devon on board today. Uh, I'm going to hand it straight on to you, Dev, if you want to give us a quick intro as to uh, who you are, what you do, and even um, maybe a couple of the sporting achievements you've gained over your time. Well, that sounds good. Thanks for having me on uh, the podcast today. I've been a avid listener of some of your other um, uh, episodes, would be the right word for that, wouldn't it? Yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my name's Devin. Um, I am the owner, well, co-owner of the Fitness Portal with Tim Fox, who was on one of the early episodes. Um, I have been running the Fitness Portal for almost four years now. So before that, I was a personal trainer at City Fitness. Uh, that was about, oh, maybe three or four years at City Fitness. I was the head coach at the Lower Hutt branch. And before that, I was a club manager of Petoni. City Fitness as well. I started there at about the age of 22, 23. Um, before that, I was a working in radio. So I've got a Bachelor of Broadcasting Communications in radio. It's a bit of a mouthful you, for you. You better be good on the podcast then, right? Yeah, let's hope so, eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure. Yeah. yeah, so I did a degree down in Christchurch for that uh, and then got an internship in Dunedin. And then out of Dunedin, I uh, went to Christchurch for a bit and worked there and then I actually got made redundant from uh, radio and my whole world got kind of flipped upside upside down. And my boss at the time said, well, you can either reapply for your job and you might not get it, or you can go back to, like you can go do something else um, and take the redundancy payout. And he said, you're not really, like I wasn't really that into it at the time. So he said, why don't you do something with a gym because you love going to the gym? And I went, oh, that's, that's a great idea. So hit up um, City Fitness to see if there's any jobs going and walked into the club manager role. Um, so that's kind of how I got started in the actual fitness industry. But I've loved sports since I could walk, uh, played football as a kid, um, except I was too fat to play be on the field. I got told that by my coach. Oh, he said, rough. you're not fast enough, you're too fat, you got to go and play goalie. Oh, so man. I got reasonably good at goalie. Um, and then played tennis, managed to get to regional level for tennis before I broke my hand in high school. So I was playing, I think it was regional three. So there's like divisions and then it goes into regionals. Mm -hmm. um, and then underwater hockey was my main youth sport. So I played, I was the vice captain of the under 17 New Zealand team. I was a silver medalist at the under 19 world champs and then bronze medalist at the under 23 world champs in 2015 um so a little, little wee while ago but um and then i managed to recently make it to the regional wellington men's team which is very very competitive and i was trialing for the new zealand men's team before covid hit and then uh tried to get back into it after covid knocked in the head got a concussion so that was that dream gone over um i've represented new zealand uh for refereeing in underwater hockey and then i got into crossfit probably not sure if i'm allowed to say crossfit on a podcast they get they Ooh, get all angry oh, if you yeah do. yeah trademark or whatever <laughs> <laughs> functional fitness. uh yeah i got a functional fitness um but yeah i did that with uh for a few years on and off and then managed to go to the team nationals um did all right there uh qualified for the individual nationals one year but didn't manage to get to go and then i was a couple of placings off making the top 10 percent in new zealand for the open um but i yeah didn't realize i was that close and mm -hmm. botched one of the workouts and didn't decided not to redo it oh, so if no. i gotten better by like 10 seconds i would have made the quarterfinals which was um a bit of hindsight but it was actually lockdown i uh the first lockdown that we had me and my brother were um bored so we grabbed some of the barbells from the gym brought them into the the garage and we just lifted for 10, 10 weeks straight and i went increased all my lifts by crazy amounts and then i thought i'd try an olympic lifting competition and managed to qualify for nationals in my first comp got to nationals got absolutely wiped off the floor choked on the big stage 
and then got the concussion the year after and I've only just got back to where I was a year and a half after my concussion. So now I'm on the um, on the grind again trying to get to uh, – I missed out on qualifying the Nationals this year by one kilo. Oh, man. Yeah, so I was a little bit, a little bit gutted by that. But, uh, yeah, now I'm just deciding, all right, I'll – there's a couple of options that I could do, but I made the decision that I need to put what I'm working on this year first, and then next year I'll go hard for the national champs and see if I can get myself a little podium placing and maybe even qualify for Oceanas or something cool like that. But lots in the works and played every sport you could imagine. I've tried everything, but the ones that I'm I'm good at are the ones I kind of stick to because, um, yeah, like I played rugby a little bit of rugby played um gone mountain biking i've run a marathon i've biked around lake topor um i've done triathlons so if, and that's epic. You, <laughs> yeah i just i just love being fit i just yeah. love doing doing this stuff yeah. and if someone says to me hey let's go run 10k i can be like yep yeah, sweet Mm. I'll, I'll grab my shoes mm -hmm. it's not a case of oh i should probably train for that first because i'm training for it every day yeah and that's how i like to live my life that's epic and there's a lot to unpack there it's clear that you've done a lot of things and been successful <laughs> in a lot of different areas as well as all that um physical stuff that you've accomplished i know that you're a massive advocate for mental health like following you on instagram you do your mental health monday posts and stuff at what point in your fitness journey or maybe even it was prior to your fitness journey did mental health and um the psychological aspects of you know health and fitness become quite important to you uh funny thing is is if you had asked me six years ago that would devin do a mental health monday i would laugh in your face and be like <laughs> nah that's for pansies bro yeah like that's not what a guy does like, yeah. i was very I was following the trends of what had been set before me. Guys didn't cry. Guys, you know, were tough. They didn't talk about their feelings, all that sort of stuff. And it was always going against my grain. So it's like when you're trying to chop wood, if you go against the grain, it doesn't, doesn't happen. So even though I was successful in a lot of things I did, I don't know if happy is the right word for it, but I was, I was struggling with my own personality and I put up a post and one of my mental health Mondays, my cousin nailed it on the head and he said, the difference in this photo and that photo isn't anything to do with the weight loss. It isn't anything to do with the, um, like what you've done. The difference is the confidence and how I've done it. So at some point along the journey, suddenly the confidence just exuded itself and I was suddenly a different person and I was, well, not a different person. I was me again. Mm -hmm. So I was able to be the person that I've always should have been. And I'm still, still to this day struggling with different where I want to go with my life, all that sort of stuff. Like I'm not saying I've got it all nailed, but I do know who I am and where I want to go. And that's happens because of me starting my mental health Mondays. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had a couple of mates who I've been in the position of helping them through um, suicidal uh, moments. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of people I've been there when they've attempted, a couple of people I've helped them afterwards. Um, and some of those are still pretty ingrained in my head, but a lot of my friends have gone through depression, anxiety, all those sort of things. And I'd never really felt like I went through any of that. And so I never really understood and I don't think it's I've ever been someone who's had depression or had anxiety. I've had those moments, but I've never really struggled with uh, whether you want to call it the disease or whatever you want to call it. Never really struggled with those things. But one year I was doing Movember and I shaved my face and I looked in the mirror and it was the first time in a long time that I didn't like what I saw. And I went, shit, I, I don't want to be... I don't like my own face. And so I said, right, I'm going to, I'm going to be open and honest about it. I'm going to tell the world that the, you know, confident Devin, um, I kind of get put into a pigeonhole sometimes and I let the world know that this was something that I didn't feel comfortable doing by doing a post about it. And then so every day of that November, I did a mental health post. And then by the end of it, I had a whole bunch of people asking me to continue it 
because they were loving what I was posting. So that started Mental Health Mondays and that was only two years ago. So even starting the fitness portal, I hadn't got to that point yet. And so by the time I got to doing my Mental Health Mondays, I've actually learned a lot by posting um, every week different things and trying to figure out ways. Like I remember when I first started it, I hit you and Chloe up for some ideas on what to post because I'd seen you guys um, were quite advocate, uh, quite good advocates for mental health. And uh, obviously you've been through some pretty tough stuff you got yourselves. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll use people that people respect and start trying to get some ideas flowing. And then that kind of just turned into its own kind of demon i guess um mm. and now it's every monday of trying to come up with something new so yeah it's been a it's been a bit of a journey with the mental health side of things but i'm i don't regret starting it and i've definitely become more aware um more of my clientele basis is starting to be more that wellness mental health basis unless they're a sports person like an olympic lifter mm. or an underwater hockey player but i've kind of got those two two demographics now it's either your your wellness of trying to you know live your life a little bit better doing exercise so you can eat the good food mm. the old soul food and then or you know dialing down training hard trying to get the goals that you've set so yeah. but i didn't realize the the significance or the the gravity of what you've been through and helped people through when it comes to the um mental health side of things that you know helping people out of suicidal attempts or depression that's really really heavy and it's I don't know, super commendable that you've been able to be there in those moments if there was other guys in particular if we're focusing on guys who are um feeling like they've got an inability to sort of express themselves or um not be the macho man like you know we're kind of grown up or taught to be what would some of your advice be to sort of take those steps to talk to people or to express themselves Oof, that's a hard one. Um, I'll, I'll put out the disclaimer now. I'm not a mental health expert, <laughs> and I'm uh, my advice. Every everything that I do with my advice is based on my own personal experience. Um, and I think if you're really, really struggling, best thing to do is talk to an expert. And I recently have actually gone through a little bit where um, I've been finding it harder to get through things. Stress is overloaded recently got diagnosed with BPPV, uh, which is, I can't remember the exact word, it's but benign proximal something vertigo. So they reckon it can be due to an overload of stress and anxiety. Don't think the anxiety is an issue for me, but the stress is definitely an issue. And um, it's taken me a lot of uh, strength, but actually this weekend is the first time I've actually ever booked in to see a psychologist. Awesome. So that one is something that's really hard to do as a guy because well and girls probably as well but mm. i find me personally i've always been able to get through things on my own or with those around me and i almost feel it's now going to a point where those around me it's that i don't know if they can help mm. and so I'm, i need to talk to a professional because i've been through a lot and i've unpacked a lot of stuff that's going on so if you're a guy who is currently going through something and you don't feel like you can talk to the people around you that that's the time to reach out but if you have one person that you can just go to and say i'm not okay then do it because it could change your life and it could save your life um I've, i'm lucky enough to have quite a few people that i'm able to reach out to when i need to i've got a very tight-knit family um my partner bex but she, she goes through a lot of shit. Um, <laughs> she actually started dating me at the very start of opening the fitness portal, mm -hmm. which was pretty, pretty intense timing. Um, we were overzealous in what we wanted to do. And she, she was the rock that I needed to come home to every day, push, pulled me through. So yeah, it's, it's a hard one, but you've just got to be brave enough to ask for help. And that's such a weird thing thought because we're all told that asking for help when we're younger isn't brave and mm -hmm. it's weak but you're not weak if you can open up and say this is what i need i need someone to help me it's interesting you're touching on that mindset of the whole idea that you can fix it yourself you know and it doesn't even have to be psychological things you're going through if 
there's something broken around the house. <laughs> no, I can yeah. fix it. I don't need the instructions. I don't need a the old, the old Kiwi attitude. Yeah, 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 hundred <laughs> percent. So even yeah, it's as simple as those things around the house. You think you can fix it? It's kind of like if you're going through something psychologically, it's so easy to have that mindset of like, ah, oh, it'll go away soon, or oh, I can fix it. I just gotta you know wait it out. But it's super yeah. interesting that um, those sort of revelations and realizations for you came from just posting some things on social media. You know, slowly yeah. opening up just from like the captions that you're writing on your photos. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, at first I used to post it and I was like, man, people must be getting so pissed off at me right now. They must think I'm such a twat, like putting up these posts and thinking I'm all high and mighty with my mm. mental health Mondays and it's stuff. It's poppy syndrome, man. Yeah. Hard. And you're worried that people are going to, you know, pull you down for it. But I've never had, I've only ever had three negative messages in the two years that I've done it. And the three negative messages were actually people trying to help just like in their own way, kind of saying, oh, this is what you said. And I think you should have said it this way, or I don't agree with your statement. And I'm like, well, that's nice. Like, mm. I appreciate that you don't agree with it, but this is for all the other people. And this is how I feel. Mm. And it's, um, it's, it's a really rewarding thing. And I'm not saying to go start posting on your social media. Like you don't have to do what <laughs> yeah. I do. It's just how I, that's my outlet, right? Um, you could write in your own diary. You could, um, actually writing in your own diary. That was, that's something that a lot of, um, professionals suggest is just get it out on paper, whether you keep it in a diary, whether you write it down, throw it in the fire and light it like there's so many ways to release everything that's going on in your head. My favorite is going for a run. If I'm really like stressed, if I just go for a run, no one around me, music blasting, that's a really easy way for me to just, um, get out of my own head. But that can be quite hard, I guess, for people who don't have the fitness levels to be able to just go for a run. So finding something that, that gives you, uh, what's the word for it? So solidarity. Is that the solidarity? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, like maybe not time alone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yeah. It's solitary time. Yeah. 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 I gotcha. When it comes to the, um, the mental health aspects and the fitness and being a personal trainer, how do you sort of incorporate that holistic or like wellness, um, aspects to your personal training that you talked about before, how you've got, you know, athletes and then wellness people, how could, um, people benefit from going to the gym and also, um, well, yeah, how could their mental health benefit from going to the gym? Oh. You're back. Sweet. I, I, just like, I figured your laptop must have gone flat or something. <laughs> yeah, so for some reason that plug that it was in wasn't charging the laptop, which I thought it was, but switch the plug, so I need to get a Sparky into... Good thing I know yeah, Sparky. Yeah, like, you know a good one. <laughs> okay, we're back. Slight technical difficulties. Yeah. Oh, so we're still yeah. recording. All right. So I believe before you conveniently dropped off, um, mm. my question for you was around how does fitness help improve mental health? You talked about how you've got the athletes and then you've got the, you know, the wellness or the holistic focus. So what are the certain things that you think um, fitness can help with your mental health? So this is something I actually learned from my, um, my PT mentor back in the day, a guy called Sean Morris. He was, um, kind of the, the guy who taught me most of what I know for the personal training, um, business side of things. Um, also taught me, taught me a lot, uh, about the, like, you know, all your physical adaptions and everything. But the, the first thing he ever said to me was how many people go to the gym to lose weight. He said, give me a percentage. So what, what, what's your percentage cam? How many go to the gym to lose weight? Oh, 85%. Maybe so more. he told me zero. Mm, why? And I was like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> 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 and he was like, it's not the, and eventually I figured it out because he wouldn't tell me, but the whole point of it is that weight loss might be their, their, goal or their direct approach but it's what comes with weight loss that is their actual goal so whenever someone comes to me and says oh, i want to lose 10 kilos i'm like cool 
and what's that going to get you? Where are you going to be with 10 kilos lost? Every now and then you get some person who's very logical and like doesn't talk feelings and they go, 10 kilos lighter. And I'm like, yeah, okay, jog on. You can go see someone else. (laughs) But majority of the people who I ask, you know, what, where's that 10 kilos going to come? Like what's, what's that going to get you? What are you going to feel? What are you going to be able to do? Things simple. And it's all cliche, real cheesy, but it always comes out either. I'm going to feel good. I'm going to feel confident. I'm going to be able to run around with my kids. I'm going to be able to go to the beach, take my shirt off and not worry about people staring at me. I'm going to be able to look in the mirror and go, I like that guy. Well, I like that girl. And that is what I believe wellness is about. It's not about, I mean, yeah, that is about looking after your body, eating the right food, all that sort of stuff. But it all comes down to the base feeling. If you feel like a two out of 10 right now, going to the gym could improve that. I'm not saying it will improve that. I'm saying it could improve that because some people go to the gym and it gets worse. Um, Very rare that that is the case. But majority of the time, if you get fitter, healthier, and you move better, your confidence is going to go through the roof. And that's what I believe wellness is. Wellness is confidence. Because if you aren't able to, you know, walk into a room and be like, I'm me, then you've got some work to do. Because that that's the ultimate goal. You really hit the nail on the head there. It's making me reflect on a lot of the clients that I had who, in your words, would have a wellness focus too. And some of the biggest wins is they come into you and they see you for the session. They're like, oh, I walked up three flights of stairs at work the other day and I wasn't puffed out. And you're like, whoa. It's crazy. Yeah. Even that in itself is, like you say, a massive confidence boost. But um, yeah, they just feel a lot more capable. Um, and when you started talking about the, um, they don't come in for fat loss, it really got me thinking in terms of like, what's the root cause of them wanting to come in and lose lose weight like you say that that's the the reason they might bring but the root cause of them wanting to lose weight is lack of confidence is Mm. like their sort of inability to feel good running around after their kids or their grandkids or even walking the dog so yeah that's that's articulated really well i haven't really thought about it like that before yeah and some people really like the idea of no one comes to the gym to lose weight other people hate the idea of it Mm. and it all comes down to your your audience, right? But the reason I have so many clients that would be over the age of 40 and a lot of them female, I think is because I get that they don't care about having a six pack. Mm-hmm. They don't care about, you know, being the best looking person in the room. All they care about is being able to move without pain and feeling good in themselves. And they want to be able to eat that scone in the weekend. They want to be able to go and enjoy a pie if they want to enjoy a pie. Mm. But they also know that they need to do something to make themselves feel better. Like I've got, uh, I do a balance class every Wednesday at the Tony Workerman's Club now. And it started with four people. So the way it works is the Tony Workerman's Club, they um, pay me, um, like I don't charge my full hourly rate, but it's it's about um, maybe you know, 80 bucks for that. And then all the members get to come for free if they're a Patonia Workman's Club member. So anyone who's part of that kind of community can come in and just do whatever classes they've got. It's a really cool system. That's awesome. Um, and it started with, yeah, three, three or four people. Two years on, I now have a regular attendance of over 40 people coming and there last week we had 50 that's 53 a turn up. class man yeah especially for people who are mostly in their 70s and 80s like mm. i started the class thinking oh yeah this might you know get to 20 30 people and now it's over 50 and we had to get a second trainer to start coming in just for safety reasons um and now they want us to we work we're working on potentially starting a second class there next year and I just love the fact that every week I've got these ladies coming out to me and being like, I was able to jump from the sidewalk over a puddle, like some, like so so simple and something that we take for granted. And these people were like, it's getting out of a chair without aching or being able to use a toilet without a handrail. Mm. 
like you take for granted what things you can do when you can do them and being able to get those back for people like that that's the where you get those endorphin rushes mm. as a trainer and it's like yes i'm helping people 100%. i'm not just part of the cog people are coming to me because they see a reason and also when you're looking at that age demographic too it's so like you know the older you get and you become elderly it's so easy to become isolated too so you think about the wider um you know benefits that people of that age demographic could have by coming to a class like that and getting lots yeah. of the social interaction too so relating it back to the mental health aspect it's awesome that they can physically do stuff more easily but also i'm sure that's super beneficial for their mental health as well oh yeah guess mm. what they do straight after the class on the beers oh they wish <laughs> it's a bit too early at the work of this club for that but straight to the coffee yeah nice. all of them big group little groups go and have their coffee yeah and then they probably hang around till the the bar opens yeah. and have a few wines after yeah. that like if you're retired why not like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i've been to the workman's club a couple of times it's, it's a lot of fun yeah. it's awesome yeah. i found it's it interesting cool. um what you're touching on with your wellness clients and um it really i don't know seems like good advice for personal trainers and especially new bright-eyed bushy-tailed trainers who are getting into it who love specifically hypertrophy training and i'm speaking like from my own experience when i started personal training too is when you get ladies who first have had enough confidence to come into the gym and seek help they're in their 40s their 50s you know they're professionals the majority of the time they don't really care about doing the best bicep curl exercise or the best exercise that's going to target their hamstrings or they want to come in, they want to have fun, they want to have a good chat with you, and they just want to do exercises that they feel comfortable doing. For instance, a big learning for me is that a lot of ladies don't like an exercise like a lying leg curl, because it's so awkward to get in and out of, they don't feel very confident doing it. So it might be a good exercise for your hammies, but maybe it isn't the best for the person that you're training. So um, yeah, if you're a personal trainer and you're getting into it, even though you might know the best exercise in the world, you got to tailor your things to the person that you're training. A hundred percent. It's massive on how much I've learned since I started. Like I've, I think I've been a PT for six or seven years now. And if I looked back at what I used to do for some of my clients, I'm just like, oh, oh, that's so cringe. But I also understand why I made those decisions. It's like, like what you said, you know, bright eye bushy tail thinking you know the world like thinking you've got all the the best things have since sliced bread it's like well sometimes simple's the best way to go mm -hmm. and that's how i like to keep my training is simple and it's just all focus on functional strength movements for those uh wellness clients because that's what they need they don't it's like you said they don't really care if they've got the biggest biceps in the room yeah you might want to chuck a few arm um, exercises in there because they're wanting to get rid of the bingo wings or mm. like have a little bit of toning in there but as long as they're feeling strong you're winning and they're going to keep coming back to you yeah yeah and i think when you start off too it's it's easy to think that this person's coming here they're paying me i need to give them you know all of my knowledge and show them how smart i am at this thing but sometimes maybe they just want to go for a walk with you and that is still worth their money you're not showing them all your technical experience and ability to you know coach them through an exercise but you're making them enjoy it and they're going to like you say keep coming back yeah i actually did that with a client the other day she came back from aussie hadn't seen her in two three weeks she's been with me since i started um and yeah she came back she was having a chat we were talking about her like new plans for her goals because the main focus was to get her over to Aussie just to have a good time. And I just said to her, I was like, look, we've got heaps to talk about. Let's go for a walk, grab a coffee. It's been a while. I owe you one. And then, so we walked 15 minutes one way, 15 minutes back. That was our 30 minute session, but that was probably more valuable to her than smashing a leg set or whatever it could have been, because I know that she's going to be sticking around for the next six months or longer most likely i don't think she'll ever let me stop peting <laughs> so it'll be right up until she can't go anymore um and that that's the cool thing about it is we've created 
such a good relationship that I don't, I know when I can suggest things like that. And it's, it's a hard one to find, especially when you're a, a fresh trainer, because some people will be like, no, no, I'm here to pay you to get a workout. But other people, it's like, actually, a walk and a chat could be the most beneficial thing for a, um, a client. Yeah, uh, just it comes because... down to that, like, their personality or their personality type, right? Mm. If you have some yeah. clients, which I'm sure you've had or have, where they're what you would say, and you know, that disc profiling thing, that's quite a stereotypical way of profiling someone, a strong D personality where they're really dominant and quite a powerful personality. They want to be in there yeah. working out. They don't really want to talk smack. They just want to like train, train, train. Someone like yeah. that, if you're a new personal trainer, probably would think it's a waste of time. You're going for a walk with them. But someone who's in that wellness sort of category and super agreeable and really nice and loves the communication aspect of it going for a walk yep. is one of the best things you could do i used to do that quite often when i worked at les mills lampton key because he was a yep. good hill right behind the gym oh nice yeah it's super steep so it's still a workout yeah exactly it's <laughs> up, up bolton street and like it's really really steep so we would go to do that sometimes you wouldn't talk too much on the way up but you could set a goal well today i w walked a third of the way up or i walked to this lamp post and then we came back down yep next session oh, okay i'm walking to the next lamp post so yeah yeah I, and that that shows a lot of um kind of like i guess empathy or um, emotional intelligence being able mm -hmm. to tell if a client what a client needs on a specific day and sometimes it is just that little bit of extra listening that can change you from being a good pt to a great pt mm -hmm. and that that's actually one of the big things i teach because i've got a lot of trainers who i train up now um a lot of my role was kind of diverting into more the teaching personal trainers rather than taking on new clients and that's one of the hardest things to teach someone is how to listen mm. especially and, when you start off and you come into it with a lot of preconceived ideas like one mm. idea that i had to let go of real quick or maybe you were the same too is that Everyone coming into the gym isn't ex as excited about the gym as you are. <laughs> you're not getting a client who's already excelling and freaking loving it. And then they want to, you know, get the extra 10% more off you. Most of the time people are going to come in, they see you as their solution. They hate going to the gym. They hate exercising, but they, you know, have this feeling that they need to do something. So that's one yeah. preconceived idea. I think you need to scrape off real quick is that maybe one in 20 people are coming to you and they're real excited about the gym yeah i call us the one percent mm -hmm. we're the one percent who enjoy putting ourselves through extraordinary pain and like suffering to get to where we want to get to the rest there was actually a client who said exactly what you just said she goes i hate the gym i hate working out but i like you mm -hmm. so i'm going to keep coming and i was like <laughs> wait what like, <laughs> okay how does that work yeah i saw um on the fitness portal instagram the other day actually this is a good segue that you're um now doing personal training qualifications through the gym mm. can you tell me some more yeah. about that i thought that was awesome yeah so we've been doing it for a while under the um new zealand apprenticeship boost scheme um where they worked for the fitness portal they did a certain amount of hours for us and it was a free qualification and the fitness portal got incentivized by um the government which was a really cool um scheme pretty much all workplaces had the opportunity of doing it and it was just so happened that when i was doing my work at city fitness i did a lot of evidence verification for them for their assessors and so I knew the skills active people. So when I started the fitness portal, I hit them up and said, how do I become an assessor? And they went, oh, you just got to do this course and pass these tests and you're good to go. So I was like, sweet, did that. I was doing er evidence verification for the apprentice boost and sending off to the assessors. And then I got qualified and they said, right, well, now you can run your own level four certificate in-house. And I went, really? And they went, yeah. And so they're like, okay, I was like, cool. So me and Tim sat down and went, right, how, how do we make this work? How do we make it beneficial for the people wanting to come on board? How do we make it beneficial for the fitness portal? Because much as I'd love it, we're not a charity, obviously. We are a business and we've got to succeed 
to make money. So everything we do has to have a return in some form, whether it's a monetary return or whether it's a, another type of return. There's always got to be a, a form of return. So we decided that we could make this really work because I've seen a lot of gyms do it, but we've also seen a lot of gym like do it well. And then we've seen some gyms not do it so well. Um, I've seen people come through different qualifications. And the one thing that I find is always missing is the practical aspects of training. Um, I've had fully qualified personal trainers come to me and they've never, they don't know how to deadlift. Yeah. And I'm like, sorry, how are you meant to PT someone? If you've never deadlift or a qualified PT come and say, I've never stepped foot in a gym. Man. And I'm like, sorry, what? Like, how are you going to train someone? Yeah. Yeah. So we decided to set up this, um, qualification where you can either pay like a weekly amount or you can pay a full amount. Um, and the qualification should take six to 12 months. Um, might be faster if you're someone who's really, really keen and you've already got that natural ability. So if you've been in the gym for six, seven years and you pretty much know as much as a personal trainer, you just don't have the qualification. That could be a really good stepping. This qualification could work really well for you because all I need to see is the competency. And I've got to make sure that you hit all the criteria, obviously. Um, and then you've got to be able to get through all the online um, qualifications as well. So there's like a big online segment, which can be done in your own time. And then there's the practical stuff where you actually take a client through in a, um, a pre-screen and then you write them a program then you deliver that program. So I can see the competency in this person and I can say yes or no based on like my level of thing. I could potentially, um, if I wanted to, I could give them the qualification based on the standings of what is there. But I also can say, yes, you've achieved the standard that's required to be a personal trainer. But in my opinion, you need to be here to be a good personal trainer. So I can really give people that feedback that they need and not exactly blunt honesty, but the honesty around like what's expected, how to keep people safe. Like I believe that there's a place for every different type of personal trainer. If you're a trainer who is training, you know, wellness clients, you obviously need to know the basic compound movements, but you don't need to be able to do the most extravagant programming. You need to be able to help someone turn up to the gym, exercise for three hours a week. And then that's, you've done a fantastic job and we need more of those people. We don't actually need more expert PTs um, who are wanting to be the next All Blacks coach or the next high performance training person for the Saints or anything like that. There's heaps of people wanting that goal, but the people that need help the most are your everyday people who just want to move a bit better. And that's a gap in the market that I don't think is being catered to because all the PTs I talk to, it's either I want to be training the top athletes, this is my demographic, or I want to start my own gym one day. Yeah. And taking advice from me, unless you want to lose the next <laughs> six years of your life, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I love those aspects of something being applicable, but also safe. Because yeah. when you are a person who wants a personal trainer, I think it's easy to have the assumption that any personal trainer you go to is going to be good. But mm -hmm. when someone talks to me about wanting a personal trainer, I describe it like any service, there's going to be a better builder or a better mechanic than other mechanics or other builders. So knowing that the trainers that you're going to be bringing through your pipeline are actually going to know how to do the thing, but also know how to keep people safe is so important. And also that um, aspect of we need more trainers who are wellness or holistic focus is so true. Even when I did my PT certificate in 2016, everyone either wanted to, like you say, train like athletes or train basically bodybuilders, you know, teach people how yeah. to put on as much muscle as they can. And then as soon as you get into a gym, especially a big sort of corporate gym or a community gym, you realize that there's very few um, people in that clientele who are interested in packing on as much muscle as they can or who are athletes. It's people who, like you say, just need to be coming into the gym a few hours a week. They just need to be coming in and doing anything. They need to feel encouraged and supported to keep turning up 
they don't really care about an anatomical breakdown of a lap pull down. Let's just, <laughs> <laughs> let's just do something fun. Oh, it's like the, the the old age classic of, um, all right, so where do you feel that? Uh, in my legs? <laughs> uh, cool, where, where about your legs? Oh, the, the front of my legs. My front the, thighs. The thighs. Yeah, yeah, the front thighs. <laughs> and I'm like, hook or I'll you say something like, okay, um, we're going to work on your scapular retraction and look at you like you've just said some wizard-like terminology. <laughs> like, like, shoulder blades go, dink. <laughs> <laughs> These things closer together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Squeeze my finger with your shoulder yeah, blades. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. It's Can, like you don't need to be that fancy. No, not at all. Can we um, delve into that time of when you were first beginning the fitness portal? Obviously, we had Tim sure. on the podcast, and it was really interesting hearing um, his perspective of it, but I haven't really heard your uh, perspective of starting the fitness portal. So I guess two things, maybe how did it come to fruition and what were some of the biggest barriers you had to overcome in order to make it happen? So it came to fruition because Tim is the type of guy that when he sets his mind to something, it happens. Um, and it just so happened that I was flatting with Tim at the time. Um, and he goes to me we should start a gym and i went yeah but where he goes my dad's got a space and i went oh yeah and then the next minute we're brainstorming ideas we got like our trying to figure out our point of difference deciding on like what equipment we'd want to go for talking to investors and i think it was three months later we had left city fitness and we're in our three month stand down period due to restraint of trade um, weren't allowed to say anything about the fitness portal um, due to the some of the agreements that we signed um, and then we were allowed to start talking from the 2nd of January as soon as the 2nd of January hit Instagram was up Facebook was up blasting it was this um, 2020 not, this would have been 2018 2018 okay yeah yeah so 2018 was the end well, the end of 2018 was when we started yeah. um, working on it and then 2019 was when we oh, yeah. started trading. So 2nd of February, 2019 is a day I'll never forget mm -hmm. because we spent three months setting up a gym, two months of that, no, three months of it. No, yeah, two months of it was in complete like silence. We weren't allowed to tell anyone about it. And then that month of just pushing it and we still hadn't even like got the floors sorted like it was crazy we had builders in we had all sorts of stuff going on um my only income was my personal training um tim obviously had his, his sparky work as well but it was like crazy full-on and it was so stressful but we had a community around us that just came came to us like we i think we started the gym with 50 members um and we had this big dream that we were going to be super competitive. We had really cheap prices because we we're going to fit so many people into the gym. And that first year was, uh, for me, especially, I don't really know too much about how Tim Faust found it. Um, I know he was stressed. Like we, we had to go through some things that we don't really wish we didn't have to go through, um, regarding like, um, you know, letting staff go and all that sort of stuff because we overcapitalized to the next level mm -hmm. um, and the gym didn't go as fast as we thought it would, but we started building a bit of a reputation. Um, and then, yeah, it was that first year I was earning less than $300 a week. Fuck all my personal man. training money was going straight back into the gym. All of Tim's money was going straight back into the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't paying Tim anything because he had his black fox and we just gave me enough to live yeah. so we could pay our staff and we could give our members the gym and make sure our dream didn't go flop in the first year because we knew there were people watching and mm. wanting us to fail. And there's still people probably watching and going, that, oh, that surely, surely can't carry on this way. Like, yeah. And that's motivating as hell when mm. you've got people doubting you and kind of you hear the, the whispers and the rumors are going around mm. and, um yeah it was probably just before the first covid we started getting on our feet yeah and then covid hit and that was another whirlwind i remember sitting in my car 
when they did the first lockdown, I just cried for like two hours. Mm -hmm. I was, I was in hysterics. I don't think at that point I was comfortable enough with Bex to let her see me cry. And I was, I think I was driving home from underwater hockey when they announced it on the radio that New Zealand's going into a lockdown. And I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty intense, but we figured it out. We made sure that we got the money coming through and um we talked to our members and our members are really supportive and we had some people offer to keep paying their full memberships um people were paying for pt online i was doing zoom sessions we got group fitness classes set up and we just worked with what we could we set up like a covid care pack that we sold for like 20 bucks a pack just to help bring in some money one of our staff like because we staff we had we were getting the government boost so we had to keep paying our staff which i was really thankful for that we were in New Zealand and that our government was, I know you can say whatever you want about the government and how they've done things, but how we responded in the COVID crisis, I believe that they did a great job with a, what my thoughts are now doesn't really matter. But at that time they did a fantastic job at supporting small businesses, in my opinion, um, because yeah. if they hadn't, we wouldn't have made it through or we would have lost all our staff. Um, so there's some credit to be given to the, like being in New Zealand and yeah. why it's worth being a New Zealander. Absolutely. I was a PT at the time and I was stressed and confused enough just being a, yeah. you know, sole trader, personal trainer, let alone owning a whole gym and having staff and all those <laughs> kind of different components. Going back to that first year and you saying how, how difficult it was and it didn't really align to the expectations. What were some of the things that kept you going throughout that year obviously you're still here you didn't give up the fitness portal was still a gym and it's expanded yep. now to two gyms what were some of the key things you did to help keep you going um, probably talking to other people who've run businesses my cousin's been a massive um help for me personally especially a guy called uh, his name's michael casey he um he owned Greg Connection back in the day, sold that, and then he now owns Forest Lodge Orchids down in um, Cromwell, and he grows cherries for oh, a living. Nice. Um, very, very successful man, but he gave me a lot of really good advice when we started, supported us a lot, um, and then people like Tim's dad were really supportive, um, and then our family members, obviously, um, were always there giving, giving us um, that extra edge, and I think it was a case of one i threw everything on the line so i had no choice but to make it work tim was the same like we got investments so we had people's money we couldn't let them down mm -hmm. because there was a lot of money that people gave us to get the first capital raise and just the fact that i'm the type of person who sets himself a challenge and i don't give up till like I can't go anymore. So I love that idea just, of having to do things out of necessity as well. Like yeah. a simple example is if you say tomorrow, I'm going to get up at 5am and do my cardio, but you've got no other plans and no other obligations. The likelihood of you doing it is pretty slim, but if you've got to, you know, leave the house by 6am, then you're going to have to do it. It almost sounds like yep. in that instance, when you feel like, you know, these people have given you the money, you've put everything on the line you have to do it out of necessity, you know, so it almost yep. sounds like there was no option really. Yeah. Oh, and that that's the type of person I am. I never like to give myself an option of way out because as soon as I do, I'll take the easy way. Mm. I, I believe all humans are inherently lazy yep. and we will always take the easiest path of resistance. It's like when you're training clients, right? Like someone will naturally try to do the easiest path of resistance. They don't want to do it the hard way. So, whenever I want to get something done, I either give it to the busiest person in the room because they're going to fit it in yeah. because they don't have any time not to. If you give it to someone who's got the whole week free, they'll procrastinate, procrastinate. And I'm that sack, but same person. I'll procrastinate till the cows come home. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be like, oh, I need to get that done by tomorrow. And then I'll send it through. Um, so I did the same thing with my personal training. I didn't have any backup jobs. I didn't have a savings. I just started personal training knowing that I can make it work because I did the maths. I checked to see, I knew I had this background in sales through my radio. So getting clients wasn't going to be an issue. It was more the keeping the clients that I thought might be the issue, which I didn't have a problem with, but 
yeah, if you if you don't want a way to back out, make sure you've got no other way then out. You can't back out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just throw yourself in the deep yeah, end yeah, and start yeah. swimming. So post that um, the first lockdown, how did you respond and how did things sort of pick up after that? So it actually, the, as ironic as it is, COVID actually kind of helped us. It's very ironic. Because, yeah, <laughs> and I feel bad for saying that because I know how much people went through and I know what I went through personally. Um, it was a pretty stressful time, but no one wanted to be in the big gyms anymore. They didn't want to be around, not no one, a lot of people didn't want to be in the big gyms anymore. They didn't want to be around the masses. They wanted to be supporting local and we ticked all those boxes. Yeah, that's We were a small gym. Mm-hmm. We were out of the way and we were local. So all of a sudden, these people who would never have looked at us twice were going, oh, you've got like three people in the gym at 9 a.m. I'm going to come see you instead of going to the big guys who've got 100 people in the gym. Mm-hmm. We didn't have to use a booking slot because of the government guidelines. So that helped because people didn't have to book and we were a bit cheeky in our marketing and we're like sick of booking for your PT, yeah. like for your gym session, come see us. And like a few people were like, really? Like you're going to go like, <laughs> play. I'm like, well, like it's Use what you got. just playing the game, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, Cause that's so, when we started coming to the fitness portal was just after the first lockdown. I don't know what yeah. it is that got us in there either. Posing room. Oh, is that what got us in there? Yeah. <laughs> so we, during the lockdown, mm. At level three, I think it was, we were allowed to go back into the gym. So we went in, we did a full reshape, and I'm pretty sure we built the posing room and moved our changing rooms. And Tim either hit up you or Chloe and said, hey, I've got this posing room. Do you want to come do your clients here? And so you guys started taking your clients out of our posing room, building into one of the comps. Mm -hmm. That's right. And And then then we was because then we both became trainers there as well because your yep. model was just so good and the gym yep. was so good as well and convenient because we lived yep. in Petoni as well. Yeah, so you guys were the, our first rent-based PTs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've actually created that model at a larger scale now, scale now where we allow part-time PTs to actually make some money. Mm-hmm. We don't just set – we don't charge – a rent base it's not quite an hourly rate anymore but we do it on like a percentage so we take a percentage of your earnings with a maximum number yeah and so once you hit that maximum number it just stays that maximum number forever going forward but it allows someone who's doing you know three four hours of pt a week to actually make some money rather than having to pay 200 bucks a week so yeah, we've got a lot to thank you guys for taking a chance of us and oh, wanting man. to jump on board. That business model was just such a refresher because that's ex- yeah. exactly what I thought too. I was like, wow, you can actually make money now doing it this way without having to work, you know, 30 or 40 hours of your time mm. if you don't have the capacity to do that. So it was such a refresher at that time. Yeah, mm. and uh, it's yeah, it's definitely – we've got quite a few part-time PTs in Tawa now. Mm. Um what, like Michael, um, mm-hmm. move with Mike is his Instagram handle. He's full time accountant, and I think he does like four hours of PT. Uh, Taylor Victoria, mm-hmm. she's part time PT, does three four hours, and so there's a lot of people who have been able to come in and pick up their passion again as like a little side hustle to their full time job, mm-hmm. and it's a really cool um, atmosphere that's getting created by those people who are so passionate, but they were not exactly passionate about the PT, if that makes sense. Yep. Like, I think it was the same for you, right? You got, you kind of got burnt out being a PT from yep. what I understand, but being able to do it on the side, that's all good. Yeah. And then you can, you, I guess it's coming back to that necessity thing. It kind of removes the element of necessity. So you can train the people who you enjoy most training. So every single mm. session, you're really looking forward to it and it doesn't have to be a full-time gig either. So yeah, I found that it mm. worked really well. And for you, in terms of opening up Tawa, what were some of the key differences or key learnings between starting the Petoni location and then opening up this freaking massive gym out in Tawa? Uh, yeah, there was. we definitely learned a lot from our first run, and we've learned a lot again from our second one. Um, like every time we do it, we're going to learn something new, and it's it's quite a cool 
uh, place to be that no matter what we do, it's always going to be different. But with Tawa, we realized after the first time that we needed to have more planning in place and we needed to really pump the open day before we opened and everything running smoothly we would have been set up march at the start of this year and it would have been all go but covid got in the way again now shipping was three months late nice um so we ended up opening in may which kind of threw us back a bit but with what we did for our capital raise this time we would have been uh sweet as Larry sort of thing, like happy as Larry going forward because we would have had everything planned correctly. But what we hadn't planned for was our plan not to go in <laughs> to place. Not, not to so, go plan. Yeah. yeah. So we've, we've learned to buffer ourselves a little bit more, but we're definitely in a much better position than we were. Like I haven't had to go without a pay this year, which is a very good feeling uh, when you're opening a gym. Um, and we yeah it's it's just such a bizarre feeling because i still kind of feel like it's all a dream mm. like walking into tawa and you've been there before right it, it's it's another level yep. to what we did in petoni petoni's this 160 square meter gym we're calling it our boutique model now <laughs> like it's our little boutique gym it's it's the it's the og and then tawa's big baby brother yeah like it is a monster it's 1300 square meters it's um got the ability to offer so much more but the cool thing we've been able to do is and that, that was one thing we knew that we needed to do coming from petoni to tower is create the community and create that feel that everyone's welcome mm. and it really um, does feel like that going into tower as well like you've got yeah. yeah you've got your bodybuilders and your crossfitters and stuff like that but then you got your older demographic you got the wellness demographic and when you walk in there it's such a nice vibe everyone says hi to each other everyone's super accommodating of each other mm -hmm. and um when you were thinking about opening up the Tawa location, what was your thoughts around what niche you were going to create in that place in comparison to the Petoni location? Yeah, so we knew it was going to be different because obviously you can't keep things the same. Um, but we knew that if we wanted to be able to keep that kind of community feel, but on a larger scale, we needed to, it needed to start with the staff. So our biggest focus was getting a good manager and i think we've nailed the perfect person for that and so Paige started with us um at the start of the year um, she was already kind of doing pt in our apprenticeship program um so it was a pretty smooth transition because she already knew about the gym but she's just got such a good head on her and she's just such an awesome person and she walks in the gym and people just beam when she's around she's one of those people that everyone kind of just get feels better when she's around so having her as our club manager and she's now our operations manager so she's looking after both gyms because she's yeah, doing such impressive. a good job i was like you can take all my <laughs> like paperwork that i'm terrible at because i'm doing it because i have to not because i enjoy it um and so yeah we've just let her kind of take control of our operations and she's just taken it to another another level so having her and then also having a good person to help the trainers because the biggest retention tools in a gym is group fitness personal trainers and your like community right mm -hmm. so to create the community we needed to have good instructors and we need to have a good pts as well as top um, management staff so we got taylor blackler in um to be our head coach and he's done an amazing job of also creating that community vibe and just like bringing the team together um, so all the personal trainers, we're, everyone's everyone's friends in the personal training, you know, having banter with each other. We'll be talking shit to each other across the gym floor, mm. like with our clients, getting our clients introduced to each other. And then our group fitness instructors are all um, just great at creating that vibe as well. So we've got a huge variety of group fitness classes, which is something that we didn't have in Petoni. And that was the niche that we needed to get into was you know, that functional fitness, 
the ability to have bigger classes, a spin class, because everyone loves a good spin class, like especially, you know, those wellness clients who just want to feel like they've had a good sweat up. Yeah. And there isn't uh, the yeah. impact and stuff too. Like it's so good for your body. You're yeah. not running or beating the pavement. If, yeah. if you were to give advice to someone who is wanting to start a business from the business experience that you had, what would I say? Let's go maybe three key things that you can three think things. of the top of your head um, in terms of advice if you're wanting to start a business. Because I don't know, from my perspective, I think you guys have done a really awesome job. And when you're talking about the vibe that you're creating at Tara, it's really evident. And I'm only there once or twice a week as well. But as soon as I'm <laughs> there, you know, I can feel it. So what are a few key pieces, pieces of advice for starting a business? So, yeah, no, I think that's, that's actually a really good question. And it's something that I've always kind of thought about. And I think one, what's your point of difference? Point of difference is a huge play in the market. So if we just started a gym, that was like every other gym, we wouldn't have had everyone, any reason for people to come to us. Mm. Um, so that, that's, that's your first, uh, my first suggestion It's a bit different for people who want to start a business where they have employees and those who are going like sole trader. If you're going sole trader, it's a little bit easier. So one, you still need your point of difference Two, get ready to work the hardest you've ever worked in your life. Like it's not easy. And if you're wanting an easy ride, go find yourself a cushy nine to five job <laughs> that you just tap away at the keyboard or whatever it is. And then you can go live your life outside of that because there's nothing wrong with having a nine to five job there or whatever job you decide to go for. But if you're wanting to take the next step and, you know, step it up for yourself and go self-employed as a sole trader, you've got to be prepared to put in the money because you'll know when you're a personal trainer, it's not as uh, easy as it looks, except for those who have made it to a point where they've got a consistent base and then they can live the life they want. I've seen PTs do 20 hours a week and they're living in a high life. Yep. They do 20, they work every morning from six till 10 and then they just go do whatever they want. But that doesn't show the up and down path to them no. getting to that point. Hey? Yeah. They worked their asses off for, months on end probably years mm. to get to that point where they had such a consistent base and they were so well known that every time they had a slot free they could put up a post on instagram and say i've got this slot free and people will book in yep. but that doesn't happen overnight that happens after lots of building so point of difference why are you why should someone come to you two um is you know be, be prepared to work and then number three is do something you love if you're going to get self-employed, you've got to do something that you're going to love and you're not feeling like you're working because mm -hmm. you're working 24 seven. You're not just working Monday to Friday. If you're self-employed, you're working every day of the week, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So on Sundays, if something goes wrong in the business, I've got to go sort that out. I've got to be there for that phone call. So I'm always on call, whether I'm on holiday or not, like there's always something. It's always playing in the back of your mind that you've, you've got something and until you get to a point where your business is a hundred percent satisfactory. And I don't know if I'll ever get to that point. <laughs> that's that's the, like yeah. chasing the dragon in terms of the business. Yeah. Right. But I think that's yeah. what's going to keep you going too, though. It's never yeah. reaching a point uh, of absolute satisfaction. It's the, it's the journey, you know, that you get, I think a lot more um, positive benefit out of than reaching this sort of fleeting end goal. Exactly. Enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the classic uh, cliche line that you see all over Instagram, right? Yeah. But it's so true. Mm -hmm. And then I guess for your uh, people starting their business, going down like the employed side, those three points are all still very important. But the most important thing for someone who is starting a business where you're going to employ people is your staff are more important than you. Mm -hmm. Your staff are the reason your business runs. So if you're wanting to run a successful business you've got to look after your staff you've got to hire the right people and you've got to create that good work culture because it's not as easy as it sounds because finding the right staff for your business is not that easy and you know we've had we've had pts and staff members who have been amazing but it hasn't been their final destination and they've moved on 
and we've also had people who weren't the right fit for us and that had its ups and downs so it's never going to be easy being a business owner so yeah you've just got to choose something that you love and just because everyone says like it's the kiwi dream to own your own business right but whether you actually need to own your own business to get to where you want to get to is a big question so my question to anyone wanting to start their own business is why why do you want to start your own business because if you can get to where you want to get to without doing it then maybe that's the way to go and on the spot that's a really well articulated answer <laughs> you did an awesome job there you covered so many important points in terms of um you know this mentality that you have when it comes to business where do you think um it's sort of derived from do you think you had it prior to you starting your training is it something that you've already had there or is there any aspects or ways that you being in the gym in the first place you know did that give you some learnings that you've then applied to your your business ownership um i think it's a lot to do with the people i've surrounded myself as mentors um like as much as the the work that i did at city fitness um didn't end in the most amicable um, fashion i don't regret ever working there and i actually really uh appreciate some of the people that were there that mentored me through some stuff and it was a bit of a shame the way it ended and there's i can't really dwell into that too much due to um professional reasons yeah uh, yeah professional reasons <laughs> that's a good way to put it but i do really appreciate some of the people that were in those positions and they taught me a lot um and then coming out of that you know uh, my uncle is a very um successful business owner as well like a, the entrepreneurs run in my family and he gave me he actually started off with the advice at the start that we should have gone franchise and we should have got like a flex or a snap or something like that because it was the safer option mm -hmm. but he did say to me that if I'm going to go down the path of doing my own thing, I'm going to have to be ready to work my ass off and I'm going to have to, you know, be able to be prepared to do things I never thought I'd have to do. And that was some advice that stuck with me the whole time. And he, he admitted to me the other, the probably last Christmas thing it was, he said, Oh, I'm glad you didn't start your franchise. I'm glad you, <laughs> you, you didn't follow my advice, yeah. but. I did follow his advice to some extent because what he told me was, you know, I've got to be prepared to work. It was him and his um, wife, Nikki. Um, so yeah, they, they've recently just um, sold their business and moved out to Martinborough and bought themselves a, a wine farm. It seems to be that side of the family like to buy of like orchids or, or, and farms. Or, and yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I surround myself with people who have done the things that I want to do. Mm -hmm and i'm constantly trying to learn from them and something that the um, big boss of city fitness said he went he walks into the room and he always pretends he's the dumbest person in the room or thinks he's the dumbest person in the room because he can learn from every single person and that's stuck with me ever since because if you're not learning from somebody what's the point mm -hmm. in having that kind of conversation so no matter who it is that i'm talking to I'm always listening for potential ways that I can better myself as well and hoping that I'm doing the same to them in return. Mm. It sounds like that's a clear example of um, the environment that you surround yourself in has a large determining factor in your success too. Mm. Who knows what could have happened if you didn't have those you know, powerful um, and insightful influences in, in your life at that time. So it's a, a pretty cool, um, opportunity that sort of came up and was was given to you as well and being able to get that knowledge from people and i love that idea of there's a quote i can't remember exactly how it goes but it's like was it, listen to people as if they can teach you something something like yeah. that and i'm a yeah. huge believer in that too i'd be pretty uh keen to learn some more about your your individual physical pursuits now so what yeah. what have you um got on your plate right now i know you touched on it way back in the beginning but what's on your plate right now in terms of your training and your training goals and um i guess the third part to that how do you structure your training at the moment so 
this year the big focus was on trying to get back to the Olympic lifting um, New Zealand champs, uh, which I just fell short of at the last competition that I did. Um, I got a, a no lift on my clean and jerk of 131 kilos, and it was all because my elbow didn't like go on one consistent movement. I had a little bit of a rebend. Oh, so everybody who doesn't know lift, lift, Olympic lifting was like, that looked good to me. Why, why did you not get it? And I was like, oh, because of the technicality. So like, you know, rules are rules. You've got to follow them. You've got to train to meet those rules. If it was a CrossFit competition, I would have been awarded it. So, you know, maybe I, I need to go back to CrossFit. And maybe that's what <laughs> yeah, the that's trying to tell me. Yeah. Um, but no, so I decided that I wanted to do something uh, challenge myself and do something that I've never done because I'm actually getting married next year. Awesome. Uh, in May, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, and my partner, Rebecca, or fiance, should I say, yep. <laughs> uh, she said to me, no, haven't been feeling myself lately. I want to work on, you know, a bit, do a bit of a cut and do a bit of a shred. I know what I need to do, but I'm just not doing it. And I'm the same. I've been kind of in a fluctuation with my actual eating habits and stuff. Like if I want to eat a scone, I eat the scone. And I think I needed that, um, especially with the stress of the gym. But we both got to the point where we were starting to look in the mirror and going, actually, we're not that happy with what we see in the mirror. So we said we need to make a change. So I talked to Taylor, our head coach, and I said, look, I know you know your nutrition. He's a bodybuilder. He's competed in physique. I don't want to be a bodybuilder. Let's just get that straight out into the <laughs> oh, open what? now because so Maybe many people are asking. Next like, thing, oh. I reckon. Yeah, they're like, when are you going to get on stage like Tim? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. never. Yeah. It's, it's not happening. No, I feel like I'd be like good at the stage presence, <laughs> but um, the whole not eating for 18 weeks, well, obviously you're still yeah. eating, but. Very strict. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm a big baby when it comes to being hungry and I get hangry, I get emotional. I'm just a pain in the ass. It doesn't so. sound like you'll enjoy the prepping process then. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to enjoy the journey, right? Exactly. Um, so I said to Bex and I said to Taylor, look, we want to do um, a bit of a cut. And he said, how does 12 weeks sound? And we went, oh, <laughs> all right, let's do it. <laughs> so the two of us, and he, he's not starving us. He's doing, like we're eating, I'm still eating over two and a half thousand calories and I've dropped two kilos in two weeks. Awesome. So like, um, I'm still eating enough food, but it's simple things like get your 10,000 steps in a day, drink your four liters of water a day, um, do three cardio sessions, real simple stuff like mm. increasing the, the neat, right? Yep. The natural energy expenditure. Um, and Rebecca's done doing really well so far as well. So that's our current kind of focus, and I, I'm calling it shredding for the wedding. Oh, yeah. like um, it. And the reason we're doing it so early is so that we don't have to stress before the wedding because obviously there's a lot of organization that goes into that so if we can get to a position where we're happy with by the end of this year we can maintain rather than aggressively cutting yeah. again especially when you think about getting your suit and dress and all that sized up as yeah. well you don't want yeah. the wedding date to be the end goal because otherwise you might not yeah. fit into your suit or you fit into your dress exactly <laughs> so that's that's kind of why we've decided to do that and in a way, I think it should help my Olympic weightlifting for next year. So November next year is when the nationals will happen. And I think it's March is North Islands. Mm -hmm. So those are going to be like the two big focus for Olympic weightlifting. So what I want to do is cut down. By doing the cut down, I'll drop two weight classes. I'll be in the 89 weight category. Yeah. I don't have to lift as heavy if I'm in the 89 weight category. So qualifying becomes a whole lot easier. So... If I can maintain and keep gaining strength, maintain or keep gaining strength, as well as losing the weight, I don't see how there's an issue. If it gets to a point where my strength starts to plateau or drop, then I'll reassess what I'm doing and decide whether I want to go up. But I've never let myself get to the point where I've had abs yeah. or been a low body fat percentage. I think the lowest I've ever got to is maybe 17, 18%, which is nothing to scoff at. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have never been there in their life, but... I just want to see if I can do it because I've never done it. So that's the challenge I've got currently. And then Olympic lifting will become the focus again after the wedding probably. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's just trying to be fit, healthy 
and trying to look after my mental health, yeah. um, which I know I need to do. The only way I can stay on top of that is by feeling good about myself and getting to a point where I'm confident my own skin again, because mm. I've started to lose that a little bit in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So that's such a paradox. Eh? It's like your mental and your physical health is so intertwined and even how you yeah. physically look, but how do you find your, your mindset changes between what you're doing now, like you're on a cutting phase, trying to lose some body fat versus your mindset coming into an Olympic weightlifting show where it's about hitting specific numbers and specific reps. What's your mindset difference between the physical body fat loss versus like the physical, let's get stronger um, aspects. Yeah, that's a, an interesting one. I hadn't really actually thought about that. Um, I guess like with the current, you know, shred shred plan mm -hmm. it's kind of just the consistency is the big thing like as long as i can stay consistent as possible the old 80 20 rule but for us it's probably more like a 95 5 rule like we're being pretty pretty strict on it like we went to dinner last night and we took our own like prepped meals sort of things like we are yeah, on a pretty bodybuilders <laughs> yeah i know it's a sad life <laughs> yeah. um but it we actually felt really good doing that so we're like okay well if we get to the point where we're not like depriving ourselves, but the consistency is huge for this one. And I know that for all my clients, if they can consistently follow a plan, they're going to do better when it comes to Olympic weightlifting, it's the same concept, right? Consistency is going to get you the results, but there's that extra added pressure coming into a competition. And the reason I love Olympic weightlifting is because you've got six chances to hit the lifts that you need to hit. So you get three snatches and you get three clean and jerks. And if you miss any of those three snatches, you don't get a total. You don't get onto the scoreboard. So it's high pressure. Everyone's staring at you and you've got to hit the heaviest lifts you've ever hit. So is it a total it. of all three of those? It's not your top one out of those no, three. So it's your top one, oh, but yeah. you've got three chances to yeah. hit that top one. Yeah. So for example, my last comp, I opened on a hundred kilos for my snatch and it was like, yep, this is my easy opener. I never thought I'd get to the day where I could say a hundred kilos That's is an easy lot. opener. Like <laughs> it, it, when I first started lifting a hundred kilos was the pipe dream. Mm -hmm. Like that was the big end goal. When I got to hundred kilos, I'd be happy and I could stop lifting. Now it's my opening lift. That's so insane. it's like, it's, it's bizarre how progress works. And then I did a one Oh three and then I hit one Oh six, which was the biggest lift I'd done in two years for the snatch and I was stoked huge group of fitness portal crew came and watched me and they were all like supporting it was hilarious all these bodybuilders standing in the crowd like yeah good work, Jeff. nice work and a couple of Ronnie Coleman yeah buddy yeah. like <laughs> and they're also like not a hundred percent sure what they're watching but they're like he lifted yeah. the thing yeah that's awesome yeah he did the thing yeah. he did the yeah he, he we let this he didn't nice fall over nice <laughs> yeah. I've done that in yeah. comp it's not fun uh i did a lift and yeah. i like just fell over backwards and just oh, no. the bar in front of me and i was like there's a beautiful photo of me just like with my arms out and stretched i'm just oh, like shit. oh shit good action shot yeah and then the cleaner jerk went into that my first attempt at the 128 which should have been an easy opener i just dropped the clean mm. i never dropped the clean like it's one of my strongest moves and i don't know pressure maybe got to me but i just got it up and then i just dropped it and i was like what the hell just happened there? So I was like, okay, reset, hit the 128. And so I did that for the second lift. And then I needed 131 to qualify. And I got the 131 up, elbow rebent, and then that was the no go. So that that's kind of how a comp works, right? And you've only got two minutes in between each lift. So it's a very high pressure situation. Usually I'm really good in high pressure situations. Like I, I um, kind of excel in those positions, I always PB at comps, that sort of thing. So the fact that I didn't, that gets my grind going. I'm like, oh, yeah. now, now I want to settle a score. So now my next goal is to smash those numbers out of the park and make 131 and 106 my easy openers. Like that, that's that's now in the head mm -hmm. for the next competition. So. For me, it's a case of like the difference between like a shred and like a, a diet plan. There's no real end goal to a shred or a diet plan. There's no like judgment day. Yeah. 
Whereas when it's a competition, there is that end goal. There is, and that's why I love competitions. So like six week challenges, is something that we do. If I wasn't the owner and I was going to a gym with a six week challenge, I'd be in it every single time because it gives me that drive to be like, I'm going to beat every single person in this room because yeah. I'm competitive as hell. And the success and is black, black and white hockey. too, right? Yeah. You, you know, if you're being successful or not. That's why yeah. it's setting those clear goals is such an important and very useful yeah. tool. Yeah, it's 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 awesome, but it also sucks if you don't achieve them. Yeah. But you grow from those failures. Mm -hmm. And I've probably learnt more from failing than I have from winning. Mm. So I'm like, meh, if I fail, I'll get a mint lesson from it. Like I got a concussion, it took me out for a year, but I've learned so much about concussions and about people's health through that process i'm like meh yeah. i won't do it again but i'm not sad that it happened silver linings to it yeah were there things from your previous sporting um achievements that you've sort of transferred over into the olympic weightlifting like what were some of the key learnings that you transferred over from your other sports to the one that you're doing now um i think from underwater hockey the ability to hold my breath has been really helpful yeah uh, that's, that's probably like the first takeaway i actually got from <laughs> jumping over um but i think it's that being a teenager and lifting well not uh, and playing a top level sport the big thing about that was learning discipline if i hadn't gone and played a sport in high school i don't think i would have learned the discipline that i have now mm -hmm. and i think having structure is really important because like i said before inherently lazy would take the easy way out so if i don't create a structure if i don't give myself room to wiggle then i'll get the shit done that i need to get done um and then i guess the other thing is <laughs> hello hello <laughs> just missed you again <laughs> oh, my computer just went <laughs> And they just decided that it wasn't no longer. <laughs> I was like, oh, thing. he's we're gone back. again. We're back. Okay, so you're, you're talking about um, when you stop getting enjoyment from a sport. Yeah. Yeah, so if you – it's really simple, right? Like it seems like pe people are always ask these like huge questions on um, – like you know how how do you motivate yourself and how do you do all this sort of stuff and it, it comes down to one you've got to enjoy the process and two you've got to have discipline so th those are the two things i've learned from playing at a high level sport especially because when you get to the top level you're all as good as each other you're all on the same playing field you've all got good skills you've all got good fitness you've all got um you're all the top of the country right so if for underwater hockey, there was 40 of us selected for the New Zealand team and 12 got taken. Wow. And of that 40, you were comp like, so it starts off that you're in a school team then you get selected for the under 18, 40 people get selected for under 18, like Wellington. And then 20 of those got selected for the A and the B team. And then 40 at the tournament and the regional champs from six teams got selected to go to the um, trials. And then that got slowly whittled down and down and down until you got to your 12 players that got to go over and play at the world champs. So by the time you get to that point, it doesn't come down to who, I mean, yeah, if you're outstandingly better than every single other player in the team, then of course you're going to get selected. But when it comes down to two people who are exactly the same skill level, they're going to look to who creates the better culture in the team. So who enjoys the sport and then who has the best discipline? Who's the person that you can trust is going to turn up every single game and play what they need to play. So that's probably the biggest takings that I've had from my other sports. And especially being in a team sport is discipline and enjoyment are so important mm -hmm. to make a team be the best. I love how you're touching on that idea of, um, cause people always ask about motivation, right? Like how yep. do you stay motivated to keep going to the gym? <laughs> I and, hate that line. Yeah, too. But it's really refreshing and just honest to say, like, I'm not motivated to go every single time. But the important yeah. thing is that you have the discipline to turn up even when you're not feeling motivated. Sometimes you're yeah. going to feel motivated and sometimes you're not. But if you only did the thing at the time when you felt motivated, that's probably going to be 50%, maybe even less 
of the uh, yep. times that you do turn up. So even if you're not motivated per se, it's important to maintain the discipline. And it sounds like you're also super self-aware in terms of not giving yourself any wiggle room. And if you yep. don't give yourself the wiggle room, then you don't have a choice. You don't, you can't sit there and think, oh, am I motivated to go today? It doesn't really yep. matter, right? It doesn't matter if you're not yep. motivated because you're going to go anyway. Because you've just got to, to do the thing. Like mm. I pay, I'm a personal trainer. I know about Olympic weightlifting. I could train myself quite easily, but I won't listen to myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I got Taylor to do my meal plan because I've got someone staring at me going, no, you can't eat that pie. Mm. Put the pie down and go eat your chicken. Yep. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do that. So with my coaching, I uh, go to a guy called Jack who's um, his business is called Empowered. So you probably see him tagged in my stories a couple of times. Mm. And he He's younger than me. He... I don't even know if he actually lifts that much more than me, but his technical eye is phenomenal. He'll look at a lift and I'm like, how did I do wrong there? So I send it to him and he goes, oh, it's your extension was off because you did this. And I'm like, how did you see that? <laughs> but like how he's got his knowledge and how he's got to where he is, like he's done a lot of work. He's worked with Richie Patterson, who's one of the top weightlifters in the country. Uh, he worked out a functional strength. He's now based in Whangarei, I believe. Um, but paying him every week, make sure I turn up yeah. because I'm like, I don't want to waste the money that I've just spent. So if you want to know how to be motivated, pay enough money that you don't yeah. want to <laughs> yeah. waste that money. Have the buy. And that's why I always encourage people to reach out to a trainer or an online yeah. coach or something. You don't have to spend thousands, but as soon as you yeah. pay a professional, some amount of money, you have a monetary buy-in already. Yeah. And then once you, especially if you're seeing them as a personal trainer, you also have the obligation to turn up too, and then you're being kept accountable. Oh, did you go to the gym twice a week like we agreed on, or did you do your walk on the weekend like you said you were going to do? Yeah. That level of accountability can just expedite your success so much. Yeah, mm. massively, mm. and it, it just helps you kind of see the light. And even if you know what you're meant to do, it just helps to have that it's that accountability, right? It's, it's having someone in your corner who, if you're having a tough day, you can call, message them and say, look, I just don't feel like doing it today. And depending on the coach, they'll either realize that maybe it is, in that case we talked about before, maybe you do need to just go for a walk that day and not go to the gym because your body is just absolutely smashed. Or they're going to tell you to stop being a little bit... <laughs> get off your couch and go for a go for a run or go for your workout like being able to create a relationship with someone that can tell where when you need to be pushed and when you need to be pulled back mm. and that's actually one of the reasons i have coached as well is to pull me back when i need to be pulled back mm. because i go gang like what do they call what did i um somebody said something to me once it was the boom and bust <laughs> so you're all boom and then you bust. Yeah. But, and that is one of my biggest problems. I go hot out of the gate and then I'm out before the race is finished. But you want to come at it with a longevity in mind, yeah. right? You want to keep going for a long period of time. It's so easy to want to go to the gym when the body's feeling good, but it might feel yeah. good today and then tomorrow. But where is it going to be in a week or two weeks if you're going to yeah. keep going six or seven days a week? That's a, that's yeah. a really good call. 100%. And in those moments when you don't know if it's, best for you to train or not having someone mm. there to make that decision for you based on their experience and their education i'm sure would be so helpful yeah mm. because you have those out external factors right like it's not just about how much you're training it's also about what's happening in your social life mm. what have you how much sleep have you been getting are you um needing to be taking medication that you've forgotten to take like there's so many different external factors in someone's life that doesn't it's not just about turning up to the gym and doing a workout or eating the correct diet. Like everything else plays an effect. Have you um, heard of the four pillars of health? I feel like I have. Is it? So there's, it's a Maldi proverb as well. The I can't ho, remember the ho water, right? pronunciation. Ho water. What's that? Ho water. Yeah. I think that's yeah, the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like your spirit, your phone, phone, now. Um, I can't remember the name. Physical. Of the spirit, and then mental, right? physical and then mental. Yeah. So having those four things in place and like, like you, you don't have to be religious to have a spiritual grounding. Like 
maybe yoga is where you get your spiritual grounding. Mm. Maybe it's spending time with friends. That's your spiritual grounding. It could be going to church. Mm. It could be going to the gym and working the Swolly Bible. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <That's> hilarious. <laughs> I, I see spiritual as, um, I don't know, engaging in things that are bigger than yourself. Yeah. I like that. Well, that's, that's, that gave me thanks, singles. Thanks bro. <laughs> Just quote that next time you use it. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll use yeah. that for next yeah, yeah. Monday. So this is what I came up with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. No, that, that is spot on though. And I, there's so many analogies for it, right? It's like how many yeah. plates can you spin at once? How do you divide yeah. your pie up into your social, your physical, your training and, um, but just trying to strike some sort of balance there is, yeah. is the goal, right? Except when you're a professional athlete or you're excelling at something really highly, it's almost inevitable that the, um, the ratio is going to be skewed a bit and to be successful, oh, arguably it, it kind of has to be. And that's where the yeah. element of sacrifice comes into it. But if that's not you, like there's no reason why it's such a significant portion of it needs to be taken up by one thing when you do have the capacity to divide it more evenly. Yeah. Mm. hundred percent. And I, I, I always say to people, what do you really want to achieve mm. when they come to see me? So yeah, they might want to, you know, get uh, down to 14% body fat, or maybe they want to run a marathon, or maybe they want to um, lift a certain amount of weight. And I go, cool. But what's more important to you, this goal or everything else in your life with that goal as well? So if someone doesn't have a reason, so let's say, if you're not going to a competition where it's your be all and end all, then is it worth the sacrifice that you're going to have to make to get to that point? And if not, we can change the timeline. We can readjust what the goal actually is. Like doing a marathon is a great accomplishment and I've done one myself, but I didn't train properly for it. Well, I did, but I didn't. I ended up getting injured and sick just before oh, it no. happened. So it was a pretty brutal, brutal experience. Ended up going 209 for my first half, which was close to my PB time, mm -hmm. and then ended up finishing in five hours, 29 minutes. So I got Damn. to 30K and both my legs just seized mm -hmm. and I just couldn't like run anymore. My knees were sore. Um, I cried probably four times throughout the run in that last 30K. I had people who were three times my age stopping and checking if I was okay and like trying to support me along. I had, there was a lady I passed at the start and was like, man, imagine running that slow past me in the last three Ks. Oh, and I was like, this is just embarrassing. But as soon as I crossed that finish line, my cousin was there. My sister was there. Um, a couple of my clients who had also done like the half marathon or the 10 K or run faster than me. And they were all there. And it was just a whole nother level of emotion. And it's something that we're not like built to do. Like marathons aren't just for your everyday person. Marathons are a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And I think people forget that because so many people do them now. But if you wanted to do a marathon, you've got to be prepared to sacrifice so much to do the training unless you're just genetically gifted and you can go run a marathon because you're an asshole yeah. like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like for someone like me, who's not a runner and I'm pretty solidly built, I think I was weighing in over a hundred kilos at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was a huge achievement for me and I set myself these huge lofty goals. And for something like that, where I'm not an expert in, it, it didn't need to be. And I kind of wish I'd had someone pulling me back a little bit more bringing me like down a few pegs and just saying, look, just run to enjoy. Don't run out too hot, run nice and slow, enjoy the moment. Look at the views like Queenstown. Oh, I was man. running and I wasn't looking at the views. So scenic. Like, why would you not stop and take a photo yeah. when you're running for four hours? Like, cause I was so set on that time and I didn't need to have to do a good time. Like it, there was, there was nothing on it. So I, that if I was to change one thing about that is that I would have, gone and just enjoyed the process rather than having that set goal for that marathon. But that's because it's who I am, mm. right? I, it, I struggle to not set myself the highest. 100%. Achievement. Yeah. And that, yeah. that learning can be so easily transferred over something like you're doing now in terms of wanting to lose body fat. 
Like, yeah. I think it's so important to have one or two cheat meals in your week just yeah. for that social aspect. So you can go out to dinner with your partner or with your friends or your family or whatever and still have that connection and not be, you know, excluded from that or have yeah. to take your Tupperware container every time or just miss out on it because you yeah. can't. But when it comes to something like bodybuilding, you have to make that sacrifice, but it's only for yeah. a small period of time. But yeah, that's such an important learning. If you do have a goal and you don't absolutely have to, you know, make the biggest sacrifice possible, there's no point in doing that if it's going to have negative ramifications and other yeah. aspects of your life. And that's exactly what we're doing at the moment. We're doing the whole consistency thing for our little, our little shred, mm. but we get one refeed a week as long as we're tracking correctly. And so that's a, a way for us to stay on track the rest of the week, because if we don't hit our goal, then we don't get our refeed. So that's a, it's a, it's a good way for me to work because I'm very much like, oh, now I've got to make sure I stay on track. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is we get one night a week where we get burgers on top of our refeed, but it's healthy burgers. Yeah. Like if you do it correctly, burgers aren't the worst thing to have in the world. And it's, so it's, but people have this mentality of, oh, burgers are bad for you. Whereas if you do it right, you can actually have a healthy burger or you could even potentially have a healthy pizza. Yeah. Like, I don't know, use one of those wraps as your base and put some good healthy vegetables on there, chuck a bit of low sugar tomato sauce as your base and boom, you're good yeah, to go. Right. Cookbook, mate. That's yeah. some point. <laughs> cook, cook, cooking with <laughs> Devin. <Yeah. laughs> We've got burgers and pizza. That's what we got. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I, I'll figure out the pine. Yes. Yeah. I feel like we've covered all the main points that I was keen to dig into today. I don't know if there's anything else that you really wanted to to chat about today. No, I don't. Um, I feel like we've, we've covered a lot, that's yeah. for sure. Um, you speak really it's, well, it's too. Been... You've made this easy for yeah. me. I've just been enjoying <laughs> sitting here listening to you, to be honest. <laughs> Sometimes I talk a little bit too much, uh, but it's the that's the radio coming out of me. Yeah, that's awesome. So if, if people wanted to... Um, you know, learn more about you, see what you do. Would um, your Instagram be the best place for people to check you out? Yeah, Instagram's mm. where I do majority of my updates. Mm. Um, I put up stories every day of my lifting journey because mm. um, a lot of people seem to find that helps with their motivation. Mm. I kind of started doing it for my own benefit and then people started saying, oh, this is really cool, keep doing it, Marka. <laughs> um, and then my Mental Health Monday, every Monday goes on my Facebook and my um, Instagram. But... I've got a public profile on Instagram, so anyone could follow me. Um, and it's just a case what's of your Instagram handle. Uh, D underscore J underscore Glover. Yeah. So DJ Glover. Um, ironically, that is my middle name is starts with a J, so it fit quite well. Yeah. Um, Not especially actually when I was DJ, in the radio. <laughs> yeah, no, used to be. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then yeah, so. Tomorrow's, um, so my, my next Mental Health Monday is going to be talking about um, how I've decided to take a leap and get in contact with a psychologist and follow my own own advice because um, I've been pretty stressed this year and uh, kind of realized that it's taking a toll and it's not fair on those around me that I'm not um, giving my best that I could 100% give. And so... If you if you want to follow that journey and see someone who has always come across as the happy go lucky sort of person, um, and see where it takes me, I don't know what what's in store for that. And I'm, in all honesty, a little bit nervous and a little bit scared about the what's going to happen. But I'm uh, I'm an open book, and that's everything I I share is raw material. It's not edited to make myself look better it's just me and who i am so um and that's what i plan on sticking to is just 100 percent me it's awesome and going it, forward. it takes a lot of courage to be so open and honest but also you know talk about your your journey with mental health and reaching out to a psychologist and stuff so i'm personally interested to see how how it goes for you so i'll, I'll be um watching and of course if you're in wellington go check out fitness portal and Tawa or Patoni, um, I highly recommend it, especially Tawa's epic because of how big it is and the range of equipment and, and facilities you have there. But, um, yeah, yeah. thanks heaps for coming on the episode, man. Really enjoyed it. It's all good.
thank you for having me on board. I've been uh, hoping you'd call, reach out to me someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've done it. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. <laughs> That's maybe me and Tim at the same time. That's got to be next, I reckon. Yeah, but awesome. 